Okay. Let's bow our hearts tonight and ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word. Can we do that? Father, thank You for the privilege that You've given to us to open up the Bible. Thank You, Lord, for each one that is here. Thank You for those that are coming on a regular basis. I pray that You'd fill me with Your Spirit and help me as I preach tonight, not to preach in my strength and in my power, but in Your strength and in Your power. I pray that everyone here that knows you as Savior would be encouraged and strengthened and glad they came. I praise you for those that have trusted you recently. And Lord, I just pray that you'd strengthen them. Lord, if there's anyone here that is not saved, I pray that tonight they would make that choice to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Lord, we'll be careful to thank you for what you do and for what you accomplish. Because we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now I want to speak to you tonight on how to have a good fight. And I'm speaking specifically on this matter of marriage because marriage sometimes can be a complicated thing. If you're not married tonight and you have yet to be married, well, that's a good thing. The Bible says that whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And I believe that. And uh, what a blessing it is when God sends you the right one. And, and, uh, and what, a, what an encouragement it is just to see the Lord work all the details out and bring the one that He has for you. Uh, some of you may be later in your life and you've, you've, uh, you, you've, had, you've been married for a long time. Some of you, maybe your spouse is, uh, is gone to glory. But, uh, you know, it's very important when you get married that, uh, that you learn how to have a good fight. Now, that's very important. Now, I don't want anybody coming up to me afterwards and saying, we never argue. Because then I'm just going to preach on lying tomorrow night. Uh, because I know that is not true. I've been married now for about 20 some years. And I can tell you this, that, that uh, every once in a while, you just really, you just throw down. I mean, I'm not talking about beaten. I'm not talking about physical fight. I'm not talking about that at all. But I'm talking about just an argument. And you got to figure it out. And you got to figure out how to have the right kind of argument. And there ought to be some boundaries that are set. And do you know marriage in the Bible is a picture? Did you know that? It's a picture of God's love for Israel in the Old Testament. And it's a picture for Christ, of Christ's love for the church in the New Testament. It's just an undeniable picture. In fact, there are whole books in the Bible that are dedicated to the subject of marriage, Song of Solomon being one of them. The, the man and the wife relationship, husband and wife relationship, how important it is. Uh, uh, the book of Hosea. God tells Hosea the prophet that he's going to marry a girl named Gomer. Aren't you glad we don't ma name our girls Gomer these days? But anyway, uh, he's going to go marry a girl named Gomer, and uh, she's not going to be faithful to him. She's going to go play the harlot. And Hosea is supposed to stay faithful to her and go after her and woo her back to himself, even though she's been unfaithful. And that's a picture of God's love for Israel, because God's love for Israel hasn't changed. They're still the apple of his eye. He loves his people. And by the way, no good Christian should be a part of any kind of anti-Semitism and, and Jewish hatred or really hatred for any particular group of people. That's just a silly notion and ridiculous notion that no Christian should get caught up of in or get, get in a part of. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that, that, that in the New Testament, the marriage is a picture of Christ's love for the church. And Christ loves the church. The Bible says He has sanctified it. We'll see it in just a moment. Set it apart by His Word. And He is going to present it to Himself without spot, not having spot or wrinkle. Now that's a fascinating thought to think that, that the Lord is going to manifest Himself in such a way. But you know, in marriage, there, there are many times when we, there are just some... There's just some arguments that burst out. And there's some fights that burst out. And it's always better to enter into a fight knowing the ground rules ahead of time. You know, the referee gets the two fighters together, the two boxers together, and he says, all right, boys, it's going to be a fair fight. And no hitting below the belt. And we want you to, to, to keep fighting. And we're going to have this many rounds. And we're going to fight and keep your, keep your fighting clean and all, all sorts of things. He tells them, well, they know the rules ahead of time. They know the boundaries. They've got to stay inside the, they got to stay inside the ring. They, they, they can't hit below the belt. They've got to They've got to have a fair fight. They can't kick. Now, this isn't an MMA. You understand? This is, a, a, this is just regular boxing. And, and so he gives them the rules. And, and, you know, it's always better if you know the rules going in ahead of time. If you know the boundaries going in ahead of time. I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, I read an article some time ago. I don't know if it was just uh, 
satire, but it sure was funny, about a man who had, and his wife who had been married for, for 40 or 50 years, and uh, she was going to divorce him because he had been faking all along that he couldn't hear. <laughs> and, and so she went on and learned sign language just because he couldn't hear. And then she discovered that he, he was faking that he couldn't see. So, so and finally she realized the whole thing was just a ruse and an act, and, and she said, I'm done with it. I'm, 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 I'm done with this. So uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's kind of funny to me. And, and, and I think it's really important that, that uh, as, as a married couple, that we as married individuals in this place set an example in our relationship. Now, if you don't set boundaries and ground rules and understand what the Bible says about having a good fight, th then it's not going to be a good fight. It's going to be a bad fight. It's going to be a knockdown, drag out, ugly fight. And pretty soon it's going to be on front display for everybody that's watching. And it's going to be a terrible testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. A uh, pastor and I know uh, a couple that, that, that just had a few years ago a knockdown, drag out fight. And it was just a terrible testimony. It brought shame on the name of Jesus Christ. It could have completely been avoided for years. And the fact is that it, that it, it wasn't. Now, when you have a good fight, you need to know the ground rules. So that's why I want to come to the Word of God. And I'm going to go to many passages, and I want to say this. Some of these passages don't particularly deal with marriage. But they deal with principles that guide our marriage. And I want us to note, first of all, I want you to take your Bible, turn to Titus. We're, we're in 1 Timothy, but just a couple books to the right. Would you, if you would, to Titus, right before you get to the book of Hebrews, you'll come to Titus. Just before the book of Philemon, notice what the Bible says in Titus chapter 2. It says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And, and he's speaking here to Titus, and he's telling him what he is to give as instruction to those believers in Crete. Uh, the believers in Crete kind of had a hard way because the Cretans had a terrible reputation. Uh, they were called slow bellies. Uh, that means they were lazy, slothful individuals. They weren't workers. They, weren't, they wouldn't keep earn their keep. They, they were always running around with a victim mentality and a handout. And they were slow bellies. He said, no. He said, you, you instruct those believers there in Crete. This is not the way they're to live. And, and you instruct them to be subject to the rules and to principalities and powers and to obey magistrates. And then he says in verse number three, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now let me say this, let me just say this. Before we enter into the rules of how to have a good fight, watch me and listen closely. Before we do that, we, we need to understand you've got to get on the right team. That means you've got to be saved. Have you been saved? Faith Baptist Church preaches that you must be born again. Uh, that, that you have to be saved. That you can't get into the next life, that is to heaven, without being born again. I want to ask you, sir, have you been born again? I want to ask you, ma'am, have you been born again? If you drop dead right now and we had to interrupt this service and bring an ambulance in this place, I want to ask you, have you been born again? If you haven't, tonight is the night that you should be born again. Uh, Jesus said you must be born again. Uh, that doesn't mean you get baptized. Uh, that doesn't mean that you join a church. That doesn't mean you turn over a new leaf. It certainly doesn't mean reincarnation. It means that you turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. You turn from whatever it is you've trusted in up to this point and you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Have you been born again? Has there been a point in time when you've done that? Now, again, I'm not asking if you've joined a church. I'm not asking if you've tried to turn over a new leaf. I'm asking, has there been a point in time that you realized you were a lost, hell-bound sinner and the only one that had an arm long enough and strong enough to rescue you was Jesus Christ? Have you done that tonight? If not, I know why God brought you to this place. 
so that you could be born again. There was a time many years ago when I was a lost sinner. I was headed to hell. I was a good kid, went to a good church, was in a good family, but that's not good enough. I was a lost sinner. I was headed to hell and I needed a Savior. And there was only one way that I could be saved. That was when I turned from my sin and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. I was talking to somebody recently and I told them that when you cry out to God for salvation, that is not a promise. That is not a promise to never sin again. It is a cry for help. It is a cry for deliverance. You're saying, God, I don't want my sin. I don't like my sin. I want to be rid of my sin, but I want you to save me from my sin. It's not a promise that you'll never sin again. Nobody can make that promise and keep it. Nobody can. Uh, you don't get saved, by the way, by cleaning up your life before you get saved. Amen. And you don't get saved by promising that you'll never sin after you get saved. That's not what Bible salvation is. Bible salvation is you don't want your sin. You don't like your sin. You realize it's thrusting you on a headlong course straight to hell. And you want Jesus to save you. And you realize he's the only one that can save you. Look again what it says in verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Uh, that means any church in Lodge Grass or any church here in this area or in this state that does not preach that salvation is by grace alone through Jesus Christ alone is preaching a false doctrine. Are, are you hearing me? Listen, watch what I'm saying. Uh, young people, look right up at me. I want all the young people to look right up at me right now. If you, if you understand this, that salvation is a free gift, you're miles ahead of the average guy in seminary. Because a lot of seminaries teach that you got to go out and tell the people that they got to be good and try hard and do good and don't do bad. And, and maybe in the end they'll make it. When that's not at all what the Bible says. The Bible says not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. I was in the Vatican a few years ago visiting the Sistine Chapel. And I was... Uh, Standing off to the side, the platform, it was a long, long building. It was probably about three times as long as this and beautiful artwork, old ancient artwork on the, on the, on the ceiling of Michelangelo. And uh, the platform came way out here. And again, it was about three times as long as this. It was a big crowd. They didn't want anybody talking. Every once in a while, a security officer would get on and he'd say, Silence, please. Attenzione, silence, please. They didn't want anybody talking. They definitely weren't Baptists. But anyway, uh, here they are, and they're a bunch of people. And this priest came in, and he said, I, I want to pray. So he prayed and blessed the people. And I went up to him, and I said, Sir, I said, I'm here with my family. My family was all standing over here. I said, now I want to ask you a question. I said, how can I know that I'm going to heaven when I die? How can I know it? He said, well you, well, you have to believe. I said, oh, believe in God? Yeah. I said, is there anything else? He said, well, well you have to do good and, and, and try hard and, and, and do the sacraments and, and go to confession. And he, he gave all this you would expect a Catholic priest to give. Yeah, you have to pay, pay uh, penance. You have to pray the rosary. You have to pray to the saints. And I said, sir, how is that possible when the Bible says that by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh living be justified? He said, you know, you've got some good questions. He said, let me talk to a few people right here, and then I'll take you all the way back to the back part of the platform, and we'll sit down and talk. I said, okay. <laughs> so he talked to a few people and answered some of their questions, and we went all the way back, just me and him, and we sat down all the way back over here, just me and him. And I'd ask him questions and quote Scripture, and ask him questions and quote Scripture. And all that he was teaching was the way to get to heaven is to do good and to try hard and to pray the rosary and pray to the saints and, and get baptized and sprinkled and all that sort of thing. But you know what he was saying was in direct contradiction to what the Bible says. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh living be justified. Young man, you'll never get to heaven if you try to earn it. Uh, sir, you'll never get to heaven if you try to, to achieve it. You'll never get to heaven, ma'am, if you try to attain it. You earn a gold medal. You achieve a trophy. You earn a, a paycheck. You can't earn salvation. The only way that you can pay for your sin is to die, go to hell, burn forever, and pay for your own sin. Or, or, 
Or you can let someone who has an arm long enough and strong enough pay for your sin, and His name is Jesus. Amen. Now watch here. He's the only one that has the authority and the ability to save you. Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Watch this. There's no name that can say, I, my name can't save you. Pastor Dawson, wonderful man as he is, godly man as he is, good testimony and reputation as he has, his name can't save you. The name of Faith Baptist Church, good as it is in this community, can't save you. Only the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can save you. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He's the only one that has the authority and the ability to save you. Let, let, let's say after service. I meet you in the fellowship hall. And I say, hey, psst, hey, get your coffee and come over here. You go quick, pour your coffee. And you think there's going to be a big spiritual conversation. And, and, and I say, hey, now look, I need to make a little extra cash. And, and, and I think you're the guy for the job. You say, oh, oh yeah, well, well, what's the deal? Well, I want to sell you the Colorado Rockies. You say, What? You own the Colorado Rockies? Well, it's a little known fact. I, I, nobody knows it. But I'm also a preacher, and, but I also own the Colorado Rockies. And you want to sell me? Well, I don't have enough money. Well, you might be surprised. Well, how much are you going to offer it to me for? Well, normally I'd, I'd say a big sum, but I'm kind of hard up for some cash right now. I'll sell it to you for $99.99. $100 if you give me a $100 bill, we're set. He said, well, well, well let, me, let me think about this. Wow. Well, is there any official documentation? I whip out a napkin and I start drawing up papers right there on the napkin. And you say, wait, $100 buys me the Rockies? Yeah. Wow. You say, I think that's a great deal because I can turn over that money in a real quick minute. And so you give me a $100 bill, kind of slip it when nobody's looking and we sip some coffee and act incognito. And uh, you go your way and go home to your wife and, and to your kids and say, kids, honey, I've got an announcement to make. I am the new owner of the Colorado Rockies. They say, what? You say, yep, yep. And, and, and you say, you say, how'd you get, what, what do you mean you're the, I bought it from Brother Smith tonight. He sold me the Colorado Rockies. And you know what your wife would be doing? She'd be doing one of two things, either laughing at you or rolling her eyes. <laughs> you know why? Because she knows what everybody else knows, that I don't own the Colorado Rockies, and I don't have the authority or the ability to sell you the Colorado Rockies. And if I do, I'm just a shyster. Watch me. No one has the authority or the ability to offer you salvation except the one that has nail prints in his hands who died, shed his blood, was buried and rose again. He's the only one. And so you can come to him. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hey, young man, you can be saved tonight. You can be saved right here, right now if you'll call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what that does? That gets you on the right team. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you on the right team? Are you on the team that's going to heaven, not going to hell? Uh, when we're talking about a fight between a husband and a wife, we're not talking about uh, them being on opposite teams. We're just talking about them working out their problems. The best way for a husband and wife to have a good fight is to make sure they're both on the same team. The, the Jesus team. The I'm headed to heaven team. The my sins are forgiven team. The I've been born again team. Have you been a born again? All right. So the first way to have a good fight is to make sure that you get on the same team. Uh, the second way to have a good fight is right across it. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. Notice what he says. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. He's, again, he's speaking to Titus, telling him just exactly how he's to speak to those people in Crete. And he says in verse number 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Then not, watch what he says. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Watch what he says. The aged women, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. All right, number two, if you're going to have a good fight, watch me now. Look right here. If you're going to have a good fight, I'm talking about between husband and wife and any kind of good, right relationship, be fair. Be fair. Don't hit below the belt. That's the first thing the referee tells you. Don't hit below the belt. Uh, don't say words like, you always, you never. Have you ever said that as a husband or a wife? 
Well, I'm telling you, that's not fair because it's not true. When you use a superlative like that and you say, you always, you never, that's not accurate. You would have to be a statistician of mega mind quality to be able to accurately make a statement like that. You always, you never, that's going to ruin it. I want to say this to you, husband and wife. And by the way, husband and wives, would you look right up at me? This is vital. Your kids are watching. Our children are watching how we interact with each other. How we interact with each other is a t tip, a type or a picture of, of the relationship of Christ in the church. Uh, there are others that are watching. Uh, the, the way we have our interaction and the way we resolve conflict is vital. Be fair. Uh, don't, don't, don't give false accusation. Uh, don't, don't use the word divorce. Don't even bring that up. Don't even think like that. Now, I know, watch me, I know that's what this world teaches. This world uses divorce it just commonplace. Watch me, watch me now. Uh, I was preaching in Mississippi. In fact, it was the church that Brother Paul Crow is a member of. And there was a man who was a bailiff in that church. And he said, he said, I'm a bailiff in a court. And he said, it's typical for us to have 70 divorces in a month. My heart broke. Are you serious? That's just in one court, in one jurisdiction, in one area. 70 divorces in a month. And I talked to him since then. And you know what? It's even higher since then. Now listen carefully. That's not right. Now I'm not trying to offend anybody here. And I'm not trying to, 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 to talk down to anyone here. Maybe you've experienced divorce and maybe the heartache of it all has just racked and rocked your world. And you said, preacher, I just, the pain of it all is hard for me to even to bear and even to imagine. But you said, preacher, I, I, there were circumstances beyond my control. Look here, I'm not trying, trying to, to, to br bring up old hurts, but the Bible is still the Bible. And God still says that he hates divorce. God didn't have divorce as a part of his original intention when he put Adam and Eve in the garden. God didn't have divorce as a part of his original intention when he gave the law for marriage to Moses. God hates divorce. It is a breaking of the picture of God's love for Israel and of Christ's love for the church. I want to say something to you here in Titus chapter 2. He says that the aged women in the church are not to be false accusers. And you know where that begins, ma'am? In the home. Sir, do you know where that begins? In the home. Number one, be fair. I, I want you to notice number two. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Back a little bit to the left. Back just a little bit to the left. Ephesians chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. The Bible says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Number three, you not only need to get on the same team, God's team through salvation. Number two, you need to be fair in your fight. Number three, you need to be honest. Can I say that? Be honest. Uh, truth always helps when spoken in love. And truth always wins the day. When you're talking to your spouse, be honest. And by the way, sir, you need to make room for your wife to be honest. I don't have any respect for a man that treats his wife in such a domineering way that she's not allowed to ever speak her mind. That's not right. In fact, there's a word for that, wicked. And the kind of man that treats his wife like that is very small-minded, very shallow. He's not, he's not willing to face the truth. In fact, I'd call him a coward. He, 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 he won't let his wife speak her mind. Now, now that doesn't mean you just, just blurt out everything. But in your relationship with your spouse, the most intimate relationship on the planet, both you and her need to be able with a calm, cool, collected mindset to be able to share your feelings. Amen. And to be honest. And to be able to walk away and that's okay. 
A, a man texted me today and he said, pray for me. He and his wife are going through some marriage trouble. And he texted me today and he said, I got an angry text from her. And, and I said, hey, look here. You need to let her speak to you. She's speaking out of hurt right now. You need to let her respond to you in a way and tell her her feelings and be honest. And she shouldn't be belittled for that. Be honest. Are, are, are you honest in your marriage? I can tell you are, you, are you telling the truth? I can tell you if you're not, not a happy marriage. And it's not a good fight. We're talking about how to have a good fight tonight. We're talking about how to resolve conflict between you and the missus or you and the mister. I want to ask, are you having a good conflict resolution in your home? Number one, you need to get on the same team. Number two, you need to be fair. Number three, you need to be honest. The Bible says lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. The scripture tells us in the book of Proverbs chapter six, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And one is a proud look to is a lying tongue. Now, now look here. Every relationship that you have, every relationship that you have that is good is built on trust. And trust is built on truth and honesty. So number one, get on the same team. Number two, be fair. Number three, be honest. Take your Bible, turn to Proverbs chapter 13, would you? Proverbs chapter 13. Again, I'm not speaking to you from direct marriage texts tonight. I'm speaking to you from principles that are found throughout the Bible in different places and different portions. Proverbs chapter 13, I draw your attention to what the Bible says in Proverbs 13 and verse number 10. You'll find Proverbs right in the middle of the Bible. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number Number 10. Boys, boys, I want you to look, look right up here at the preacher. Guys, look right up here at me. Look right up here. You don't need to be talking to the people behind you. Look at Proverbs chapter 13. Notice what the scripture says in verse number 10. It says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. All right, number four, if you want to have a good fight, then number four, be humble. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. When you're humble, you're going to disarm your opponent. This fight is not going to last very long if you're humble. Watch this. Humble enough to admit you're wrong. Uh, are you ready? Humble enough to agree with your adversary. Do you know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 in the greatest sermon ever preached? He said, agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Do you have a hard time agreeing? Are you disagreeable? You always got to say it your way, and everybody's got to see it and say it your way. Now, watch here. There is no greater place to resolve conflict than right in the marriage and right at home. And there's no sometimes harder place. You know why? Because we're right. And if I was ever wrong, I'd let you know. <laughs> Well, we just we just think that we want to be right and, and we don't want to ever dis we don't want to ever admit that we're wrong. I, I was wrong once a long time ago. Never been wrong since. <laughs> that's just the way we think. I, I'm I am right. And that's that. And so he digs in his heels and she digs in her heels and the fight is on. <laughs> the fight is on. They sang it on the way down the wedding altar. Uh, you know, something needs to happen. Now, now I'll tell you, that, that's not going to be real good. If he can't agree and she can't agree and they can't come to some terms of disagreement, well, then it's just going to be World War III. And how does that work out at night? How does that work out when you're expecting her to make you a nice hot meal? Huh? How does that work out at night uh, when, when you're expecting him to give you a listening ear? It doesn't work out at all. And it's not right. I, I was preaching in a camp in the Midwest. And the camp director that is there now told me this story. And it perfectly illustrates this point. 
He said the former camp director had a neighbor, and, uh, and the new camp director coming in said, you know, I'm going to go meet that neighbor. So uh, the old camp director said, oh, don't even give him any tr mind. He said, uh, we give him cookies every year at Christmas, and he doesn't want anything to do with us. Nothing but argumentative and hateful and mean-spirited. And the new camp director said, I'm going to meet the new neighbor. So he walks over there one day and he's got a clipboard in hand. And he says, hello, I'm so-and-so. And I'm the new camp director over at the camp across the street. The guy had a list 15 things wrong with what's going on at the camp. He said, there's all kinds of trouble. And he said, okay, well, let me get my clipboard out and start writing something. Hey, he said, the first thing is you got all kinds of junk and old cars and beat up cars right next to my property. He said, that's just, I don't like that at all. He said, number two, he said, the guns that you shoot at the gun range are always so loud. And he said, okay, okay I'm going to write that. And he said, from October all the way till April, there's smoke billowing all over because they... They heated everything with wood. And so it's so all kinds of smoke billowing. He said, we can't see anything. That makes me so mad. He said, okay. He said, well, I'm the new camp director. Let me see what I can do to fix this. So he got to thinking about uh, the junk along all the neighbor's property. He said, we don't need to have all these old broken down cars. He said, we can clean that out. So he cleaned it all out and had it all towed away. And cleaned up the, the, the border of the property. And he said, you know, guns that are super loud. It was kind of shocking to me because it was across the street and through the woods and over the river and to grandmother's house you go way a long ways away. He said, loud guns mean cheap quality guns. He said, these are just 22s. He said, I worked for the ATF. He said, we can get new guns. That, that solves that problem. And then he got to thinking, is there a reason why we need to heat a bunch of old, old garages and, and uh, uh, just everything with wood? I mean, we got propane. We can heat the house on the side of the camp. And, and then we can heat with electric heat. And he said, you know what? We're not going to burn wood and have smoke billowing onto his property. He said, so I went over there to his house after I made these decisions. And I said to the uh, camp director, or the, the neighbor, I said, you know, uh, we, we fixed that, that, the junk on the side of the border of our property. Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah, I, I did notice that. He said, and, and he, said, uh, he said, have you heard any guns lately? He said, no, no, I haven't. He says, because we got new guns and they're better quality guns. He said, oh, thank you. And he said, I just want to let you know, he said, we're not going to burn wood anymore. He said, we're going to heat with propane and, and, uh, and we're going to heat with electric heat. Oh, oh. Well, okay. Well, later that day, the camp director had to go down to the local uh, permit office to just meet the people. He hadn't been there very long. He just wanted to meet him in case he wanted to build a building. And when he came in, they, uh, they said... Oh, you're the camp director. He said, yeah. He said, y y you know me? They said, yeah. They said, we got a complaint from your neighbor about smoke for months at a time in a, in a year coming on their property. And we had hired seven engineers to test the smoke and see whether or not it was worthy of a complaint. And if it was, we were going to shut you down and not allow you to build for 10 years. And he said, we just got an email this morning from your neighbor withdrawing his complaint. And I thought to myself, what a Christian way to handle an argument. Do you know what he did? He agreed. Now, I don't know why we have to be so bullheaded and pigheaded and hardheaded and dumbheaded as to think that we can't ever agree with our adversary, even somebody that may not even be just like us. You know, it's a good testimony in the community when you come to a place of agreement and you aren't always trying to get in a fight with somebody. Especially your spouse. Now, I bet there's some things that you have disagreed with your spouse about that you probably could agree. Yeah, we'll agree to disagree. Well, okay. <laughs> I can tell you those biscuits aren't going to be real good tomorrow morning. And I think it's shameful that Christian couples have to fight and argue and be like the Lockhorns and they get their kicks out of fighting with each other when little eyes are watching, neighbors are watching, church folks are watching, 
and it's a crying shame nobody can some come to some form of agreement. I wish you could see what a preacher sees. People in the pew don't always think that the preacher sees. They think he just gets up and he's got blinders on, he's got stuff on his mind, he's got his sermon to give, and got announcements. But preachers see how people fight. Sometimes people come to church, couples, and they're like this. That's like the fighting Irish. I mean, you could tell he's mad at her and she's mad at him. And they're sitting with their shoulders toward each other and their legs crossed. And they got their Bible open. They're trying to get something from the Word of God. But they can't get anything from the Word of God because they're fighting and fussing with each other. Sometimes they come like this. I mean, not talking. When a happy, happy, happy. What a great message we're sending to all the people that are watching. That marriage is wonderful. Look, you can get married and have a big knockdown, drag out fight. I mean, this is better than WWF, the wonderful world of wrestling. I mean, why, why, why go to an all-star wrestling fight when you can get married? I mean, just get married and just throw down right there. I mean, who wants that? All the time. Fighting and fussing and fuming. And you know what is? Somebody's not humble. Maybe both. Uh, and the Bible is very clear. Only by pride cometh contention. All right, look at Proverbs 17, since you're all the way over here in the middle of the Bible. Look at just a chapter or two later. Proverbs chapter 17, see what the Bible says. Notice what it says in verse number 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. Number one, get on the same team by getting saved. Number two, be fair. Number three, be honest. Number four, be humble. Number five, be current. Be current. He said, he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. I want to ask you a question, ma'am. Do you have a bag of rocks that you carry against your husband? Oh, I wish I could tell you what he said to me about three months ago. Dirty, rotten buzzard. I mean, it was the most thoughtless, hateful, mean-spirited, pig-headed thing you ever heard. Three months ago? Are you ready for it, sir? If it was yesterday, it's in the past. If it was an hour ago, it's in the past. And you know what God says about the past? Forget it. Forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching forth into those things which are before. You keep harboring those past wrongs and those past hurts. And look here, look here, look here, watch here, watch here. I'm not saying that there's not hurt in marriage. Sometimes there is. But you know, hurt can be healed. If you'll say these words, are you ready? I was wrong. Please forgive me. Let's all try to say those words together, shall we? Ready? Here we go. I know it might be hard. Maybe some of you haven't said it in a long time. Be a little atrophy in the vocal cords, but you probably can do it. Here we go. Ready? I was wrong. Please forgive me. Man, I'm telling you. There's something about those words that can just solve the problem. Please forgive me. I was wrong. And in a marriage, why not? Why wouldn't you say that? Instead of repeating a matter over and over and over. And by the way, hey, sir... Nobody in this church wants to hear all the problems about your wife. We got our own problems. Nobody, ma'am, wants to hear all the problems about your husband. Now, I'm not saying there aren't times when you need counsel. Sometimes there are. And I'm not time saying there's never a person that you shouldn't go to. Sometimes you should go to a, a godly pastor or a godly pastor's wife or whoever it may be and get good, godly, sound counsel. But watch. You go around go talking bad about your spouse to everybody else, to the guy at the bank, to the lady at the drugstore. To, to, you know, the only thing that does is make you look bad. And what a pity and what a shame. Uh, look here. I was in Ohio a few years ago, and there was a man who had been an F-16 fighter pilot. Now he was an inventor. And, and he, he's teaching Sunday school, and he's teaching young married class. He said, you want to hear my marriage advice to the young marrieds? I said, oh, absolutely. I need all the help I can get. He said, number one, don't speak evil to your spouse. I said, well, that's good. Let me write that down. He said, number two, don't speak evil about your spouse. I said, well, that's good. That's good. Write that down. He said, number three. I said, number three. Speak evil to, speak evil about. What is he going to say? He said, don't think evil 
about your spouse. Ha! Oh, man, I wasn't expecting that. He took his F-16 fighter pilot, came down, and knocked me right between the eyes with an intercontinental ballistic missile. I wasn't expecting that. Well, you know what? If you don't think evil about your spouse, you won't have any problem with the first two. And doesn't the Bible say something about charity? Charity thinketh no evil. That means if I love you, I am willing to overlook your flaws and forget past wrongs because I love you. And my love for you is bigger than your problem and your wrongs. I remember hearing a preacher years ago talk about how when he was in third grade, he came home with a report card that was good. He got C's instead of D's, and he was so excited. And he came inside the door, can't wait to tell his mom, and he opened the door and he jumped up in the air and said, Mom, look what I got. And when he was middle of the, in the middle of the air, his mom said, Don't jump! She had a cake in the oven. Oh, man. He came down with a thud, and he, she got so upset. She said, I was working hard to make this cake. She said, go up to your room. And he went up to his room sulking. He said, finally get C's instead of D's, and I get fussed at for it. So he sits down in his bed, and the more he thought about it, the more upset he came. And then it was time for supper. She called him down, the whole family sitting there. He didn't want to eat. He was moving his peas to one side of his plate and his carrots to another. Who wants that anyway? And, and then it was time for dessert and he was so upset he didn't want dessert. His mom cut him the first piece. He looked down and it was one inch of cake and three inches of frosting. He said it's the best cake he'd ever tasted. He said my mom never knew it but every time I found out she had a cake the rest of my life I jumped. He said that was some good tasting cake. You know what that was? That was a mistake covered by a whole lot of love. And are you ready? We need a whole lot more love in this world. I'm talking about real, genuine love. And we need it first and most right in the home. Right between the husband and wife. Well, I tell you, 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 you say, you know, I, I'm just going to I'm just going to honor the Lord and I'm going to forget past wrongs. Yeah, that's going to be a good fight. That's going to be a real good fight. Uh, be current number six. I want you to see what the Bible says. Uh, Matthew chapter 18. Would you turn over to Matthew chapter 18 quickly? We only have a couple more. And, and, and uh, we've got to get to some of those oatmeal cookies with frosting in between. Matthew chapter 18. Are you looking what the Bible says? Matthew chapter 18. Look at what it says in verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. Now time out. This is speaking about the context of a church. And Jesus, the founder of the church, is telling the disciples, the apostles, the, the foundation stones of the church. He is telling them uh, that they are to resolve conflict within the church. And he said, when a brother commits a trespass against you, he said, watch it, verse number 15, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, when you get married, when you get married and you've taken the first step, you got on the same team. You know what that makes you? Brother and sister. Uh, he's a preacher. That's kind of, I don't like to think about that. Well, it's just, you just have to think about it. It's brother and sister. You're in the spiritual family. And watch now, watch now, now you're husband and wife. So if your brother or your sister commits a trespass, watch it, go to him or her alone. Again, this, this, this goes into my last point. But I want to say, number six, keep it between yourself. Keep it between yourself. What would you think of watching a boxing match? And I mean they're in the 17th round and they're going back and forth and they're fighting all over the place and it's a good one. And all of a sudden the one opponent punches him in the face and whoa, he gets knocked all over to the ropes and he looks at that person and he looks at the ref and he's in, he well, yeah, that's what you do in a boxing match, damn though. What, what do you think you're supposed to happen? Or what, what would you think if, if in the third round, all of a sudden, he gets hit in the face by his opponent, and he looks over in the crowd, just, he hit me! What would you think about that? Well, what do you think this is supposed to happen? It's a fight. Yeah, then what? Now, this is what you're going to do. You don't bring the people in the audience into your fight. You don't bring the ref into your fight. Are you hearing me? You don't bring the coach of the opponent into your fight. Oh, that was, that was, that was too much. 
well, this is when you turn the boxing match off. This is when you share it to all your friends on social media and say, look at this bozo. <laughs> right? Watch. You keep it between yourself. Now, this is tragic to me. But a pastor friend of mine who's been a pastor for 30 some years, we've grown up together. He's been in the ministry a few years longer than me, said this. He said, Dwight, he said, I am this close to recommending to younger couples that instead of them just going and getting married like they normally would, to having them write out prenuptials with a lawyer. He said, because nobody cares anymore and nobody wants to fight for their marriage. The least little conflict, the least little trouble, the least little problem, they just quit and they give up and they go to the divorce court. And he said, I think they ought to write up some prenuptials where it would be hard for them to get a divorce, for her to divorce him and him to divorce her. That would force them back to the table. I told that to my dad and my dad just cried. My dad's 88 years old this year. He said, have we gotten to that point where we can't work it out between ourselves? We're so pig-headed. We're so small-minded. We're so full of ourselves and so selfish that we can't work it out. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There are some serious areas where we have just got to resolve conflict. By the way, young people, I want every young person to look right up at me right now. Look right here. Look right here. You're not married yet. But someday you're coming to marriage. And marriage isn't all a fight. Marriage is a blast. Marriage is a joy. And I want to go on public record and say I'm thankful that I'm married. And I want to say I'm thankful I'm married to my wife. And I want to say I'm thankful that God led her to me and me to her in just the right time. And young people, you wait and pray and seek the Lord and be what you ought to be and pray for the one that God has for you in the future and God will lead you to them. And you don't have to get this thing wrong. And walk here, this doesn't shadow anybody or anyone. And anybody in here, in this room, that has been through a difficult time in marriage would stand and testify that what I'm saying tonight from the Word of God is true. And they would say, we need more of this. And I wish I'd heard this sooner. And this is important for every marriage. Do you know why every marriage matters in a church? Because it's a picture of Christ's love for the church. And look here what he says. Here we are in the book of Ephesians. I want you to see what the Bible says. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, would you? Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to see this point number, uh, point number 7. Be fair. Get on the same team. Be fair. Be honest. Be humble. Be current. Keep it between yourselves. Uh, are you ready? Don't bring family, friends, and the general public into it. It'll only make matters worse and people want to take sides. All right, watch. Number 7, be forgiving. Be forgiving. Shake hands at the end. At least you're married for pity's sake. <laughs> now watch. Be, be forgiving. There ought to be some sweetness. There ought to be some kindness. There ought to be some love that says, I'm going to forgive Ephesians 4. Notice what he says in verse number 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you having some good fights? You, look, somebody came to me when they were early married, only been married maybe about a year and a half. They said, we never fight. And they almost got divorced. So I don't believe that. Now I want to ask you a question. Here's my last point. Be willing to fight for your spouse. Not always against your spouse. He used to preach you, what do you mean? Look at Ephesians 6 and we're through. Ephesians chapter 6, notice what the Bible says in verse number 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Look, look this way and I'm through. Point number eight is this and final. Be willing to fight for your spouse. I'm talking about fight spiritual battles for your spouse. You know, everybody has a story and everybody has a difficulty and everybody has a reason why they may be responding one way or another. But hear me, everybody has a struggle. There's not a one of us in this room that is not broken. Every one of us is broken in some form or another. And we need the help of God to help us through our brokenness and to heal our hurt and to help us fight and win against the enemy. Look here, your enemy's not your spouse. Don't believe it. You heard about the, the, the devil. He slithered into church one day and, and he, he said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scare all these people. And he came in the back door. And when he came in the back door, Everybody bolted. I mean, everybody, including the preacher. He ran around, ran and ran out the side door. And uh, everybody left except the man sitting right over here. And the devil said, why, why wouldn't he, he leave? So he got right up down to his aisle and he looked right down at him. And the guy just looked back at him and rolled his eyes. Made the devil mad. So he slithered right down next to him and sat right down. And the man just kind of shrugged his shoulders. He said, hey, he said, I'm the devil. Why aren't you scared of me? He said, I've been married to your sister for 23 years. I'm scared of you. <laughs> now watch here. Your spouse is not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. And boy, we need to fight against him in prayer. And we need to be praying for our spouse. Hey, the devil comes a gun and he wants to come a gun for you. You think he's happy when a marriage lasts? You think he's happy when a marriage thrives? You think he's happy when a marriage shows the sweet joy of Jesus? When the husband loves his wife and the wife shows respect? Respect and honor to her husband. Do you think that makes God happy? No. That's why he invented. Do you think that makes the devil happy? No. That's why the devil invented the feminist movement. That's why the devil invented every other movement to destroy and ruin and wreck and mar and scar marriages from start to finish. And the devil doesn't love your marriage. He's not happy that you're getting along. He's not happy if you've learned how to have a good fight. And I'll guarantee you, he's certainly not happy and he's not going to hang around. When you start fighting for each other in selfless, fervent, spiritual prayer and warfare against Him. I'd say, though, that our kids are worth the fight. I'd say that our grandkids are worth the fight. Maybe you've made some mistakes in the past. Hey, that doesn't justify mistakes right now. That doesn't justify giving up now. And I want to say this, that, that there is a tip, type and a picture of God's love for Israel and Christ's love for the church that ought to keep us saying, I'm going to fight in the right way, on the right turf, on the right terms, in the right place, at the right time, and above all, I am going to fight for my spouse and for my marriage. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for your word. Lord, it's, it's, it's not easy sometimes hearing some of these things, but we need it. We get so complacent in our marriage, in our home, in the relationships that really should matter the most, and sometimes they matter the least. And oh, dear Lord Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us for letting selfishness creep in. Forgive us for thinking that we're the only pebble on the beach. Lord, help us to be selfless, especially when it comes to our marriages. Lord, I pray for all those here that perhaps may not be married. I pray, Lord, that that's something yet to come in their life. Help them to seek you and honor you and please you and seek your will in it all. Bring them to the right one at the right time and help them to be what you want them to be. I pray for each one here who perhaps has lost their spouse, that you'd encourage them to keep loving you and honoring you. Step across the finish line to hear, well done. Now with heads bowed and eyes.